morning and welcome everyone to today's Friends Life Care Wellness Webinar, Understanding Stroke, presented by speech therapist Lauren Schwabish. My name is Gail Tamarchio and I'm the Friends Life Care Director of Wellness Initiatives and I'll be your moderator for today's session. You should have received an email from me a few minutes ago with a copy of the handouts, including a copy of today's presentation. If you did not receive an email from me, please email info at FLC for Friends Life Care partners.org and they'll be sent to you. Again, that's info at flcpartners.org. And I'm sorry that they did not get sent to you earlier. The email was so large. We have so many people on this webinar that um, we found out that they didn't go through, so we had to just resend them. So, but before we get started, I'd like to go over some housekeeping information to ensure you know how to fully participate in today's webinar. In the upper right corner of your screen, you should see an attendee interface. And on it, you'll see audio, and you are listening in using your computer or tablet speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select the telephone, just click on the telephone button in the audio pane, and the dial-in information will be displayed. If you're having a problem hearing the presentation, please check the volume settings on your computer. Now, you will have the opportunity to submit questions and comments at any time during the presentation by typing them into the questions pane of the interface to the question box there and then just hit enter. Lauren will answer all questions at the end of the webinar. So, and she has graciously offered to stay on as long as necessary in order to do so. Her presentation is very, very thorough and you may find that she answers your question at some point during the webinar. Uh, now, Lauren, I'd like to introduce her now. She, Lauren Schwabish is a speech language pathologist and rehabilitation clinical specialist in the Neuro Rehabilitation Program at Inova Mount Vernon Hospital in Alexandria, Virginia. And there she's developed comprehensive stroke education programs for staff, patients, and families. She has 20 years of experience working in hospitals and rehab centers, evaluating and treating patients with neurological illnesses, including stroke, traumatic brain injury, brain tumors, and neuropathy of critical illnesses. Now, Lauren takes an integrative approach to therapy and when she seeks natural functional opportunities in which to participate, uh, to practice communication and thinking strategies with her patients while incorporating their specific interests and needs. Lauren, we are so excited about your presentation. As you can tell, there's a lot of interest in this and we really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you for being here. Good morning, and thank you so much. I am so thrilled to see how many people registered to learn about stroke. So if you're listening to this today or you're gonna watch it um, recorded at a later time, I am confident that you will walk away with some new knowledge or even just confirmation of things you may have already heard or that you know, um, but it's backed up by really good quality research um, and recommendations. And like I said, I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions you may have. Um, there is a lot of information in this presentation, so no need to remember it all. I've sent a list of um, really great websites and resources that um, if you don't already have, Gail will be able to get to you. So let's get started. Okay, so like Gail said, I am a speech pathologist, um, and here's where I work at Anova Mount Vernon Hospital. Uh, it's a small community hospital outside of D.C., but we are a very large um, program in terms of inpatient rehabilitation. So um, a patient will come to maybe another hospital first, um, be diagnosed with a stroke, and then once they realize that um, there are deficits to be addressed before they return home, they will get admitted to our unit. And one of my favorite, favorite parts of my job uh, is um, teaching a stroke education class, which I do for patients and their families and their friends to share information um, about why stroke happens um, and what they need to do to recover. This is a real passion area of mine. You can probably hear in my voice how enthusiastic I am. Uh, I really do like to share um, information because I think stroke is um, can be a really scary thing for a lot of people. Uh, and what you'll learn on later is that it's actually quite preventable. So um, the first thing we need to talk about are our two priorities for today. Uh, the first thing is I want you to know how to prevent a stroke uh, in yourself or in a loved one. And the second thing is, I want you to feel prepared to identify and to manage a stroke when it is happening. 
Uh, you'll learn later that time is really of the essence when it comes to stroke treatment. And so knowing what a stroke looks like and getting the right help at the right time is absolutely essential. So let's start out by talking about what a stroke is. First of all, stroke by the numbers, there's almost 800,000 strokes in the US per year, uh, which comes down to a stroke basically happening every 40 seconds. Um, it is something that affects not only the person having the stroke, but also the family members and friends. So pretty significant impact on our, um, on our communities. It is the number five uh, leading cause of death, which actually when I started working, it was number three. So there's been some major um, medical uh, accomplishments that have allowed people to survive stroke, but unfortunately it remains the leading cause of long-term disability. So we're still looking at a big impact on someone's life, even if they've survived a stroke. One of the things we need to understand is that um, the brain requires a lot of blood to exist and survive every day. So you can see in this picture, there's lots of labels here, but don't really worry too much about that. What I want you to notice are these big blood vessels that come up through the neck. I've put my cursor here on the computer screen, so you should be able to see it. Uh, these carotid arteries that are coming up in the side, and then the basilar artery, which comes up in the back of the neck, these all feed into this circle right here called the circle of Willis. And off of the circle, uh, the blood vessels branch out and almost like a tree get smaller and smaller as they go to feed the cortex of the brain. The blood brings oxygen, the blood brings nutrients, and that's what really keeps our brain functioning um, well every day. And if you think of these blood vessels like pipes, like you'd have in your house, a pipe that is blocked or a pipe that is burst is essentially a good analogy for stroke. Fun fact, the brain is just 2% of the weight of the human body, but it consumes 15 to 20% of the blood supply. So it's, it's a high energy user. And the total length of the capillary surfaces, that's where the blood vessels are delivering those nutrients to the brain cells, is about 400 miles. Pretty impressive. So again, if we're looking back at that pipe analogy, the most common kind of stroke is a clogged pipe stroke, which is known as an ischemic stroke. This is about 87% of all strokes that happen. Uh, you can see in this small inset here, the circle where we have a blood vessel that has some plaque that has accumulated on the side of the vessel, uh, which narrowed the opening significantly that a blood clot, which can form at the site in the brain or can form somewhere else in the body and travel to the brain, that blood clot got stuck. And so what it does is it ceases the distribution of blood flow to the brain. So the brain cells are no longer receiving that oxygenated blood and they start to die. And what that results in is loss in function, which we'll talk about in a moment. Another kind of stroke is less common, but I still see it all the time, uh, is a hemorrhagic stroke. That would be your burst pipe type of stroke. This is where a blood vessel ruptures and the blood leaks onto the surrounding brain tissue. So we have the same problem where the brain cells that need the blood are no longer getting it. And then we have a secondary issue where blood is spilling out onto the brain tissue surrounding that area. Um, and if it's big enough, it can cause a lot of swelling, uh, which causes additional damage. Then there's something called a TIA which stands for transient ischemic attack. This is kind of like that clogged pipe stroke. You can see in the picture here, that yellowish um, sort of blockage is creating a temporary cessation in the blood flow to the brain. Uh, the symptoms may show up and then leave pretty quickly, even within minutes or an hour. Um, and some people may not even realize this is happening or they may disregard it but it's really truly a warning sign. And 40% of people who have TIA will end up having a stroke later on. So this is absolutely something to take seriously uh, and seek out uh, medical attention to, uh, first of all, make sure that it's not a stroke. And then second of all, to determine uh, what needs to happen to prevent a stroke from happening. 
If you've been personally affected by stroke or have you known someone who's had a stroke, you can probably think about a couple of symptoms that really um, stood out to you or that you noticed. Uh, the brain is arguably one of the most important organs in our body. And because it controls everything we do, depending on where the stroke happens, how big the stroke is, we have a variety of effects that can result. So I just wanted to go through those really quickly um, so that we recognize the full impact of stroke. Uh, obviously, physical changes, um, not being able to walk or to move or to use one's arms and legs. Stroke can affect sensory changes, so not being able to interpret, let's say, temperature or pressure um, against the, the body. Cognitive changes, um, things like concentration, attention, memory, um, being able to even be aware of one's own deficits can be a side effect of stroke. Changes in language, um, that's difficulty in you know, being able to communicate, being able to talk or to understand, uh, to write or to read. A big part of what I do as a speech pathologist is uh, swallowing. Stroke can impact uh, someone's ability to chew or move food in their mouth uh, or to move it down into their throat or even protect their airway. Um, the brain stem, which is at the, the sort of the stem that which the two hemispheres sit upon, is a major center for swallowing. Uh, and we see lots of patients where a stroke there, even if it's a very small region, a small stroke can have a major impact on someone's ability to eat and to drink. Bowel and bladder, uh, those uh, our body eliminates um, by getting messages from the brain in response to, let's say, a bladder that's filling up. And so sometimes people become um, unable to um, eliminate, let's say, to empty their bladder where they're retaining it and they actually require catheterization. Or unfortunately, people become incontinent because their brain and their uh, body are just no longer communicating. And then emotional changes. Uh, many times people's affect can change. They can be very flat or conversely, they can be laughing and crying uh, inappropriately, something called pseudobulbar affect. Um, so obviously head to toe, any, um, any impact in our brain is going to affect us in a, in a variety of ways. Okay, so let's talk about the signs of stroke. This is something that I always tell my patients and my families, and now I'm telling you, um, I want you to go out into the world and really be an ambassador for stroke. Um, I want you to talk to children in your life. I want you to talk to friends um, to be able that we should all recognize the signs of a stroke when they're happening because um, we may be the person that makes the biggest difference in terms of getting the uh, person having the stroke the help that they need. The American Stroke Association came up with this neat acronym, uh, BFAST, and it breaks down some of the most common signs of stroke uh, that we see and also tells us what to do in the event that we see them. But there are more than just um, a few, so I'm gonna go through them in a little more detail, and then I'll come back to this BFAST acronym and we'll go through it so I can show you what it means. So um, all signs of stroke happen suddenly. So if you're having difficulty with moving your arms or your legs, but it happens over the course of a long period of time, that's not what we're talking about here. We're really talking about the sudden onset of numbness or weakness, especially down one side of the body. And you can see in these orange and blue bodies that the colorful side of the brain is opposite the side of the body. That's because the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and vice versa. This is a pretty common sign that people will uh, report when they notice that they're having a stroke. Difficulty walking, this is also something that will happen. Um, again, could be associated with that numbness or weakness. Um, a lot of times people might you know, get up from the sofa or try to get out of bed in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. And they're having a hard time walking and they end up falling. Um, and that's a big sign that they've had a stroke. Any difficulty talking is a sign of stroke. This ranges from your speech being slurred or unclear, or even what you're saying. So your ability to communicate with words. Some people um, at the time of their stroke are unable to talk at all, or they may be saying words, but they're not making any sense. Difficulty understanding speech is also a sign of stroke. This is typically noticed by someone around the survivor. 
so a friend or a family member might be talking to someone and they're not able to demonstrate comprehension of their questions or their directions and that's a big red flag. Trouble seeing in one or both eyes. Again, sudden onset, right? So we're not talking about your progressive vision changes as you age. Um, this is something to think about where it may be one eye or it could be part of each eye. If we think of our visual fields for each eye like a circle, imagine drawing a line down the bot uh, from top to bottom of that circle. It could be just the left side or the right side of each of those circles that gets affected, what we call um, a field cut. So really challenging to be able to look and see um, and navigate your environment when you're missing half of your vision. Dizziness is a sign of stroke. Um, oftentimes, if you're really dizzy, you may also have nausea and vomiting. This is one of those signs that, you know, you can be dizzy for lots of reasons, um, but dizziness and isolation with no precipitating event is very concerning for stroke. Um, Similarly, with loss of balance, this is also something that is a sign of stroke. Uh, both dizziness and loss of balance um, tend to happen with posterior circulation strokes. So those blood vessels that come up the back of our neck that um, feed the cerebellum, um, that's where these symptoms tend to occur when a stroke happens there. Confusion can be a sign of stroke. Um, some of it could be related to some of the language problems that we have. It, it can be very confusing not to understand what's going on around you. Um, this is definitely something that, especially sudden onset um, with no precipitating event, um, like alcohol or drug use, should be um, very much concerning for stroke. And then finally, a severe headache of unknown cause. Uh, remember those hemorrhagic strokes, those burst pipe strokes we talked about? Uh, they typically can be very painful where someone may show up to the ER with the worst headache of their life, uh, what they call a thunderclap headache. And that is a big red flag. And the doctors there uh, receiving that person are very much going to look uh, immediately at the blood vessels in the brain. Okay, so back to be fast. Um, you can see that they kind of consolidate some of these symptoms. So B stands for sudden loss of balance. E stands for eyes. F is for face. The face might be droopy or twisted or looking uneven. A stands for arms, but they've added in also legs. That's for that, you know, you know uh, sort of one-sided uh, numbness or weakness um, happening in the body. S stands for speech, so your speech could be slurred, may have trouble speaking, or even that confusion. And then T stands for time. Call 911. Uh, and the reason why is that, uh, as the saying goes, time is brain. For each minute that a stroke is happening, there's a tremendous change in the architecture of our brain. Uh, we are losing 2 million brain cells. We are losing 13.8 billion synapses. Those are the points of connection where neurons are, are sending electrical and chemical signals to one another to send messages. And seven miles of axonal fibers. So the parts of the brain that are really responsible for sending messages within the brain and down to the body are really um, uh, remarkably affected. So much so that they say the brain ages 3.6 years for each minute that a stroke is happening. So time really is crucial. I recently came across this ad campaign um, that it's okay to overreact to stroke. And I really like this because I think sometimes, you know, stroke is different from heart attack in that the signs are not necessarily painful, right? Besides that severe headache of unknown cause, numbness or weakness is something that doesn't hurt. And I think that people tend to feel like they don't want to bother the ambulance driver or they don't want to go to the emergency room. Um, but the fact of the matter is that suspicion alone is enough to call 911. And so it's okay to overreact to stroke. You're, you're probably saving someone's life or significantly reducing uh, the chance of disability if you act quickly. Okay, so now that we know what the signs of stroke are, what happens? What do we do with that time if we, if we act right away? Uh, what, is, what are the treatment options? Well, we said most importantly, you wanna call 911. And part of that is that 
treatment is highly dependent upon when you arrive to the hospital and even how you arrive matters. So calling 911 sends an ambulance, right? The ambulance staff is trained in certain screening measures that will be able to determine if this is a stroke or not, and even um, where the stroke may be. Remember I showed you that little circle of Willis there in the blood vessel picture? Um, if the larger vessels um, have been affected, the EMT drivers may be able to screen for that and pick up on that. And that will determine if you have an option of which hospital to go to. You wanna to get to a certified stroke center. Uh, the Joint Commission, which is an organization that accredits hospitals throughout our country, has a disease specific certification. So a hospital like mine, which is a primary stroke center, goes through uh, rigorous protocols to make sure that we know how to treat a stroke from the moment someone arrives through our doors. So I would encourage you, no matter where you live, uh, to get online and look at some of the hospitals around you and see how they rank in terms of their capacity to deal with stroke. Um, especially if you do end up having some significant risk factors, it's good to know which one you would wanna go to. Uh, and again, getting an ambulance to bring someone who's having a stroke is the best um, the best way to address it. Partly because uh, there's this concept of the golden hour. From the minute you end up in the ambulance bay at my hospital, they really do start a stopwatch. And they are looking at every single minute that goes by, wanting to get you to see a physician, to be evaluated by a stroke team, uh, to get into the CT scanner, which takes a picture of your brain, tries to determine whether there's um, what type of stroke you're having, if there's a bleed or not, and then to start the treatment right away. Um, I get emails from the stroke coordinator at my hospital. Uh, they're sometimes able to get all of this done in just over half an hour, which is pretty remarkable. And that's why getting there by ambulance versus, let's say, driven by a car makes such a difference. One of the pictures that they're starting to um, take and to really utilize when they look at stroke is this, which is called CT perfusion. It's a CT scan that looks at the blood distribution or the blood flow to the brain. And you can see here in the circle, the core infarct is the area of permanent damage. So that's where the stroke has happened. And that blue area that's, that's a lot bigger is called the penumbra. And the penumbra is essentially a region that is at risk of starvation. It's not dead yet, but it may be compromised in time. And the doctors do a calculation, and depending on the size of the core infarct and the size of the penumbra, that will determine what kind of treatments you can get. One of the treatments that's really the gold standard for those ischemic strokes, again, those clogged pipe strokes, is what's called Activase uh, or known as TPA. This is basically a clot busting drug. So this is a medication that once they figure out that a clot has caused the stroke, can be administered with IV. Um, it basically travels up through the blood supply to the area of the stroke and breaks down that clot. So just like a clog in the sink, it allows the, the blood to flow again to the part of the brain. It's really remarkable, um, but it is um, it does have a pretty short window. So you can receive this medication only up to four and a half hours after the start of the stroke symptoms. Uh, and the reason for that is they found that if they gave it later than that, then the risk of bleeding, because remember it's a blood thinner, the risk of bleeding goes up significantly. Um, so that's something where if you know when the stroke sign started, then this may be an option for you. And then another treatment that is also time sensitive is something called a mechanical thrombectomy. Um, this is pretty amazing technology. This happens at a comprehensive or thrombectomy capable stroke center. So again, when you're looking at your hospitals, you wanna see if they do this procedure. This is where a neurointerventional radiologist, so a very highly qualified trained physician, will put a catheter into your groin and wind this all the way through your body, around your heart, into your neck, into your brain, uh, to the site of the clot. 
And remember we talked about those bigger vessels, those large vessels uh, right off of that circle. This is the region where they are targeting. Um, they don't send the catheter up higher into the brain only because as the branches get smaller and smaller, uh, this would prove unsuccessful and probably do more harm than good. But basically this catheter then sends out a metal stent um, and traps the clot and pulls it out uh, with a bit of suction, uh, restoring blood flow to the brain. Uh, there's been some recent studies that have shown that this is um, effective for a longer period, um, but that it is most effective and does the best good within, I think, about 90 minutes of a stroke. So time is still of the essence, although they found that people could qualify for this up to 24 hours after the sign of their stroke. Um, again, that CT perfusion scan really helps the doctors calculate whether this is a treatment that will do someone some benefit or not. And then surgery may be a treatment option, especially for those hemorrhagic strokes. Um, if you think about you know, a burst vessel, the first goal is to stop the bleeding. So if it was caused, let's say, by an aneurysm, um, they need to go in there and clip it or coil it. Um, like I mentioned before, if the blood pools and starts applying a significant amount of pressure on the brain, the doctors may have to remove the skull uh, and remove the blood and then allow the brain swelling to calm down before they replace the bone. Um, there's another procedure that isn't necessarily um, a stroke treatment, but something that they may do to prevent stroke, which is called a carotid endarterectomy. I've heard it fondly referred to as the roto-rooter, where they um, look at the carotid, again, that big, big vessel coming up in the neck, and if it's narrowed significantly by plaque, a surgeon can go in, cut that carotid, remove the plaque, and then sew it back up again. So uh, surgical options are obviously pretty significant, but it may be a life-saving treatment after all. Okay, so we've talked about those treatments. Hopefully you realize that they are quite time sensitive, but now let's talk about why people have stroke in the first place. Um, sometimes my patients get so confused and, and, and they scratch their head, they're really not sure why they're there in the first place. And I think that they feel a lot better when they understand the risk factors only because it kind of maps out you know, the future for them, how they're gonna prevent another stroke from happening. When we talk about risk factors, there's really two categories. Uh, there are uncontrollable, so things we have no way of modifying, and then there are the controllable. Uh, as a hospital therapist, this is a lot of what my team does is trying to help patients identify uh, and understand the major risk factors that they can uh, do something about when they go home. So the uncontrollable risk factors include age, uh, starting at age 55 and older, all of us are at an increased risk for stroke. And this risk more than doubles for each decade of life. So, you know, if you're up in your 80s and 90s, you have a more significant risk of stroke than someone who's younger. Race, African Americans and Hispanics are disproportionately affected by stroke. Um, and this is a multifactorial issue where um, African Americans in particular are maybe at an increased risk of certain other risk factors like diabetes or high blood pressure or obesity. But there's also a significant healthcare disparity in our country. And so some of the drugs and some of the treatments may not be um, afforded. Uh, family history, there is definitely a genetic component to stroke. So if you have a family history of a mom or dad or sibling who's had a stroke, that is a risk factor. If you've had a prior stroke, unfortunately you are at risk for having um, future strokes. And then finally, gender. Um, you know, depending on where you read, you may see men more than women, but ultimately women have, um, I think, more strokes than men, and stroke kills more women than men. Uh, women have some particular um, hormone sort of related risk factors. So oral contraceptives, uh, especially when paired with smoking, can increase your risk for stroke. Also, postmenopause hormone therapy can increase your risk for stroke. Um, also, women live longer than men. So there's a gender age um, relationship there, where as women age uh, longer, they are at increased risk for stroke. So these are uncontrollable. We just wanna be aware of them, but they're certainly not uh, things that we're gonna be able to impact or change. Here are your medical conditions that can lead to stroke. Um, and many of the patients that I see when I look at their medical record, um, 
you know, a number of these um, sort of co-occur. First and foremost is hypertension. That's your high blood pressure. This is absolutely, without a doubt, your number one risk factor for stroke. Um, sometimes this is all it takes. You don't need any other risk factors, but high blood pressure. And we'll talk a little bit about what that actually means, what the uh, parameters are. Diabetes is a risk factor for stroke. Uh, the reason why is that increased glucose or increased sugar in the blood tends to have um, a negative impact on our blood vessels. Uh, it can make them stiff and rigid and more prone to um, plaque accumulation uh, and narrowing the vessels that can then become clogged with the clot. High cholesterol is a risk factor for stroke. This could be familial, so something that runs in your family, or you may have high cholesterol due to lifestyle factors. Atrial fibrillation is um, a heart arrhythmia. So your heart beats um, in an irregular fashion. What happens with this is basically um, as the chambers are no longer effectively pushing blood out into your body, uh, a little bit can pool in one particular part and form a clot. And so the next time a big pump comes along, it can send that clot um, throughout the body into the brain to create a stroke. Uh, atrial fibrillation is sometimes the thing they look at most closely when there are no other risk factors uh, identified. And uh, it does uh, increase your risk for stroke significantly, about fivefold. Uh, atrial fibrillation is also something that tends to affect people as they age. Sleep apnea, this is uh, when your breathing repeatedly stops and starts as you sleep. Um, sometimes people are aware of it, sometimes they're not. Usually uh, what they say is your bed partner or someone sleeping in the house with you uh, can usually hear very loud snoring or even detect when someone is not breathing at all. Sleep apnea, um, interestingly, is a risk factor for stroke. It can also be a side effect of stroke. And then artery disease, any type of, um, you know, coronary artery disease that we might associate with heart attack uh, will also be bad for your brain. So anything that um, causes accumulation of plaque to build up may deprive um, oxygen-rich blood to the brain. So these are your major medical risk factors that certainly have treatments um, and lifestyle factors that we'll talk about later uh, that can control them or modify them. And then some lifestyle behaviors that we strongly associate with stroke. So physical inactivity, uh, poor diet, that is a diet that's high in saturated fats, sugars and salts. Smoking is a big risk factor for stroke. And then finally, obesity, um, which is associated with uh, increased BMI, uh, that is your weight in relation to your height. Okay, so I'm sure everyone here is maybe thinking about their own risk factors. Uh, and the question might be coming up is, well, what can I do to prevent stroke? The good news, at least what keeps me very encouraged about all of this, is that the American Stroke Association says that 80% of all strokes can be prevented by risk factor management. So sometimes it's just understanding what your risk factors are and then looking to the research to say, what is the most effective way to treat my individual risk factor profile. Uh, the American Association, Heart Association, Stroke Association, came up with this uh, Life's Simple Seven. Uh, so it's three different physiologic factors and four different behavioral factors. And I'm gonna um, dig deep with you on each of these to talk about the sort of best practice recommendations. Um, but they really said that it's these seven things that if you change them or modify them, that will reduce your risk, not only for stroke, but for heart attack. So first and foremost is that high blood pressure. Um, you need to get control of it. If it starts to increase and go up, you wanna be monitoring it. Um, this is a most effective way to reduce stroke. Um, in 2017, a group of uh, physicians who um, evaluates and treats heart attack and stroke redid the parameters for blood pressure categories, effectively um, increasing the percent of the U.S. population that had high blood pressure from 32 percent to 46 percent. And they did that by sort of lowering the threshold. So you can see on this 
um, chart here that a normal blood pressure is less than 120, which is the top number, and uh, less than 80 on the bottom number. So the top number, the systolic number, is really the one that we're most interested in. That is the pressure within the vessels when your heart is beating and the diastolic is in between beats. So the systolic is the one of most interest. And you'll see here that it doesn't take much to push you into an elevated or even a stage one hypertension. So uh, the reason why they kind of redid this is that a lot of people were going to the doctor for a checkup and getting, let's say, values in the 130s or even the 140s, and we're not being given any necessary counseling on behavioral modifications to try to keep it down. And so unfortunately, over the course of time, that person was sustaining more and more damage to their blood vessels, which led to inevitable heart disease or stroke. So by catching it sooner, the idea is that we can give behavior modifications a try first, and then ultimately, if those don't work or those um, are uh, unreliable, we can then pair it with a medication. But the idea is that you wanna be as close to 120 as possible. Um, just as an indicator, when people come into the hospital with a stroke, they usually have blood pressures that are 180, 190, or even over 200. So really interesting, good to know what your blood pressure is. Um, you can check it at the doctor's office. Um, typically to be labeled as hypertensive, they will look at um, at least two measurements, one including um, not at the hospital. Um, sometimes people get what they call white coat syndrome, where they become very nervous um, in the physician's office, and so their blood pressure is oftentimes a little bit higher. So um, a measurement outside of the doctor's office is also taken into consideration. For those of us um, who do have high blood sugar, we obviously want to reduce that. Again, the goal being um, to minimize the um, negative impact on the blood vessels, uh, especially the big ones that go to our brain. Um, if you, uh, you know, go to the doctor's office, they may be looking at what's called your hemoglobin A1C. That is a blood test that looks at um, basically your blood sugar stores over the last two to three months. Um, and that is something that will sort of help a doctor diagnose if you are pre-diabetic or you are diabetic. Um, and then once that becomes a concern for someone, they need to start monitoring their blood sugar. I have two pictures here of glucometers. Um, the one on the left is your standard glucometer where you poke your finger, uh, you put a little drop of blood on that strip and you put it into the machine. Um, they read it pretty quickly these days, uh, but it's one point in time. And the technology that's on the right is fairly new, um, but is really a much more comprehensive picture of someone's blood sugar over the hours of the day. So for example, this, um, well, let's, this little uh, white circle here is a patch that actually goes onto your, onto your body, could be on your arm. Um, and you'll see that it has a little graph there. Uh, the number is uh, 112 with an arrow pointing up. What this does is it allows the person to understand where they're, trend, where they're trending in terms of their blood glucose levels. So for someone who really has to monitor um, and take medications at a certain time, this is a, a much more um, kind of a larger view of what their body is doing, which is really neat. In general, these are the ranges um, of blood sugar that we're looking at. So um, 70 to 150 uh, is kind of your normal number. Um, if it goes too low or it goes too high, like 150, um, you definitely need to have an intervention um, put into place. Usually for people who are at risk for stroke, it's that your blood sugar is getting too high um, and you require some insulin to help reduce the glucose in the blood. Interestingly, um, I think those continuous glucose monitors tend to keep people more in that normal range more frequently. So avoiding those peaks and valleys, uh, which is where end organ damage can be occurring. But everyone is different, so I would encourage you to ask your doctor about what your ideal blood sugar range should be. Another component of Life Simple 7 is controlling high cholesterol. Um, again, when we think about our pipes, we want our pipes to be nice and clear, right? We don't want them to be clogged or narrowed in any way. So I like this picture that I um, found and kind of shows the differentiation. So on the left is a normal artery nice and open. 
Um, we want it to be flexible. We want it to be able to accommodate when our blood pressure is higher, uh, when it goes down again. And when your cholesterol is high, um, the LDL or that bad cholesterol um, is drawn into the tissue. So it's this waxy substance. Um, and what it does is it narrows the opening of the blood vessel itself, which not only increases the blood pressure, but also sets the stage for a uh, blood clot or material to get stuck. So this is a really kind of good understanding of um, the impact of cholesterol. I think it shows it pretty effectively. Now the question is, should I take a statin? I think for some people, um, doctors felt very comfortable in just prescribing statins you know, to everyone. Um, and the fact is that statins are intended to be used by people who are at high risk of heart disease. Um, in the um, website links that I gave to Gail that you should be able to get, you can actually uh, find a link there to the American Heart Association, which has a calculator uh, to help you calculate your risk of um, you know, needing a statin, so what your cardiovascular risk factors are. Um, you should take a statin if you've had a personal history of heart attack or stroke or have peripheral vascular disease or if you have extreme elevations in cholesterol. So that would be an LDL cholesterol of 190 or higher. Um, if you are between the ages of 40 to 75 and have diabetes, a statin would be uh, an appropriate medication or if you have sort of an accelerated risk, maybe it's genetics or other factors. Um, but this is definitely something that um, should be discussed with the doctor. Um, secondary prevention, which is, you know, for my patients, preventing another stroke, statins are pretty standard. But in terms of primary prevention, if you're over age 75, there's not a lot of evidence that um, prophylactic statin is right for you. So I would encourage you to ask your doctor um, I will also say that um, for people who have had side effects associated with statins, um, that might be like muscle aches or even some cognitive, you know, foggy feelings, there are new medications. Um, there's actually a calculator that a doctor can use to figure out the right one for you. And very recently, there are some injectable medications, which um, are significant in reducing someone's cholesterol. So that's your main risk factor. There are new medications available. Now, whether they're covered by insurance or how easy they are to get, that might be a different story, uh, but it's just good to know they're out there. And I think part of um, what I really enjoy about educating people about stroke is that, you know, there are options. And so we wanna press our doctors and our medical establishment to um, justify their decisions and give us the best option for us. Okay, I don't think anyone here knows, uh, probably that this is no secret, but smoking is um, a significant risk factor for a variety of health conditions, including stroke. It actually doubles your risk for stroke. And the reason why is that smoking um, will result in a thickening of the blood. It can increase the risk of blood clots. Uh, it can narrow our arteries and restrict the um, oxygen flow in the blood. So a variety of cardiovascular impacts when it comes to smoking. And I will add in that exposure to secondhand smoke can also increase your stroke risk. So this is something to think about. Getting active, um, you know, again, no secret to anyone probably is exercise is quite good for you. What they're recommending in general is 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week. Um, but I've also heard that any bit counts. So even if you're not, uh, let's say, running on the beach, like these gentlemen in this picture, um, walking up and down the stairs, um, you know, taking a walk in the neighborhood, just being up and active as much as possible counts as activity. So uh, if it was a medicine, it would be prescribed to everyone. I think exercise is simply the one of the best ways we can keep ourselves healthy. And if you look at the benefits of exercise through a stroke prevention lens, um, it impacts your cholesterol, it can lower your blood pressure and help you control your blood sugar. So in addition to the things that we sort of normally associate with exercise in terms of weight loss and you know, heart function and mood, it does actually have a significant impact. And I think that when we talk about those folks who are newly hypertensive, um, just by exercising or um, you know, moving their bodies a little bit more, they can make that difference in um, you know, getting out of that danger range. 
Eating well is essential to good health, and it is really important when it comes to stroke. Uh, when I teach my stroke education class, this is where everyone gets so excited because everyone does have an opinion um, of what it uh, comes down to good health and good eating. Uh, some people are really want to hold on to some unhealthy habits because we eat the foods we eat for all different reasons. Um, and some people just know that they need to eat better, but they're not really sure what. Um, they might hear some, you know, low salt, no salt, low fat. Um, they're not really sure where to go. So the good news is that there is a diet that is absolutely well-researched and indicated for stroke. Uh, and you don't hear about it, honestly, in the popular media. Uh, you'll hear about, you know, paleo and keto and Atkins and all of these diets. But the one I really want you to know about is this one. This is called the DASH diet. Uh, stands for Dietary Approaches to Stopping Hypertension, High Blood Pressure. And it was developed in the 1990s based on research that was funded through the uh, National Institutes of Health. It is really rigorously studied. So this isn't a flash in the pan. This is very much something that has been found um, just even by itself to reduce high blood pressure. Um, so this, if you look at this sort of pie chart here, the predominant foods you're gonna be eating in a DASH diet are gonna be fruits and vegetables. So four to five, each, so five, that would be four to five fruits, four to five vegetables per day, um, and grains. So this would be mostly whole grains. Um, this would be, you know, whole grain bread, whole grain pasta, uh, brown rice, things like that. Um, and to a lesser extent, you're gonna be having lean proteins. So that would be your fish, your chicken. Um, you're gonna be eating um, meat, uh, plant-based proteins. So legumes um, like lentils and black beans uh, or nuts and seeds um, to supplement your protein needs and uh, keeping fats and sweets limited and uh, low fat dairy, two to three servings per day. Uh, this is very similar, has a lot of overlap with the Mediterranean diet, if you've heard of that. I think the DASH diet is helpful in that it's a little bit more prescriptive um, they'll tell you exactly how many servings you should have versus the Mediterranean diet, which I think has a little bit more sort of like guidelines, you know, plan your meal around these food groups. Um, but what I really like about the DASH diet is that it's um, high emphasis on fruits and vegetables and color because the colors that make the red pepper red or the eggplant purple um, are really the things that are essential for heart function. And remember, if it's good for your heart, it's good for your brain. And so um, this is a very good diet. Um, there's uh, on the resource list I sent around um, a book I actually think is a really good one for this is called Dash Diet for Dummies. And it talks about sort of the mechanisms of the Dash Diet and how it impacts um, high blood pressure and also diabetes. But if making um, major changes in your diet seems really daunting, I always tell people think about some small changes. Um, you know, going from white breads to whole grains, you know, making half of your grains whole is a really great way to improve your diet. Uh, not only your cardiovascular risk, but your gastrointestinal function as well. Uh, salt can have a really serious impact on high blood pressure. So looking at the salt content, uh, not necessarily the salt that you shake out onto your food, but the salt that's kind of in our foods, especially those processed foods, is something to watch out for. So using more herbs and spices uh, to season your food. And then finally, really, really restricting, if not eliminating altogether, um, sugary beverages. Our bodies just weren't meant to um, gain derived sugars um, from our liquids. So watching that soda and sticking with water, which is definitely the healthiest thing to be drinking. Eat real food cooked at home. Um, I think that processed food is a big culprit in a lot of the major risk factors uh, for stroke. And even just by cooking, um, you know, similar foods you might eat, let's say at a restaurant, making them at home, you are automatically decreasing the um, fats and the sugars and the salts. So eating real food cooked at home is a phenomenal way to reduce your risk of stroke. And for those of you who know young people, really encouraging their ability to learn how to cook is um, a great investment in their health as well. 
I love this website. This is the USDA. Um, they have now changed. Remember, they used to have the pyramid, and now they have a plate, which makes a whole lot more sense. So choosemyplate.gov. Um, this is a great visual to just remind you of what your nutrients should look like. Again, looking at half of your plate to be fruits and vegetables, um, a good amount of grains, and a smaller amount of protein. Uh, this is a great website if you're looking for tip sheets. They have tip sheets for how to eat well in a restaurant, how to eat well if you're a picky eater, um, how to increase water in your diet. So really great information there. This app is, um, you can get it on an iPhone or an Android called Fujicate. Um, there's lots of different features that this has, but my favorite one is the food finder. So what this does is it allows you to open the camera on your phone and you can scan the barcodes um, on a drink or a, um, a food package and it will give it a grade based on its nutritional values. Um, and it is a really nice way to understand without having to know and interpret a nutrition label. Um, one uh, food that I have in my stroke education class that I scan is a can of uh, no salt added diced tomatoes. Um, and fruits and vegetables get a better grade, uh, let's say an A or an A minus, than let's say soda or candy. So I go to scan um, this can of tomatoes and it shows up with a C. And everyone in the class is always shocked. Um, is it the can they ask? Is it is it the fact that it's preserved in some way? And the answer is no. Uh, Fujicate has an explanations tab. And when you click on it, you see that high fructose corn syrup has been added to these diced tomatoes. And the food company did that because they know that with no salts, the brain needs something else to gravitate towards. So they made it sweeter. Um, so I like Fujicate. I have two kids and they use Fujicate all the time at the grocery store. And I think it really cultivates um, a good appreciation for how healthy our foods are. Um, it's a really great app. So again, we've gone through all of these Life Simple 7. Um, if you go online, you can kind of plug in your parameters and see which is the area that's um, most pertinent for you. But it's a really nice way to uh, identify and manage those risk factors. A few things I didn't mention though, uh, sleep. So we talked a little bit about sleep apnea, but sleep in general is so important to brain health. Um, there's a lot that happens when we sleep. Um, our brain washes out, you know, those junky proteins we don't need. Um, it consolidates our memory. Uh, I think a lot of people are sort of used to bad sleep though. I think there's people who just say, I'm just not a good sleeper. And this is where I would really stop and ask you to, um, to bring this concern to your physician because there are um, interventions that they can provide for you. Um, and it's not only that you should feel good, but that you could reduce your um, risk of cardiovascular disease as a result. Managing stress, again, not on Life Simple 7, but I think it's really important. Um, stress, unfortunately, can aggravate those risk factors for stroke, like high blood pressure um, and heart disease, but it can also lead to unhealthy behaviors that put us at risk for stroke. So things like smoking, reduced physical activity, you know, unhealthy eating. So um, some stress we can you know, remove, eliminate, some we can't, but just having some techniques um, in your toolkit when you are feeling stressed um, could be uh, meditation, could be prayer, could be listening to music, whatever it is, um, recognize that that is absolutely part of your self-care it is essential for your mental health and it's also essential for your cardiovascular health. And then finally, I want you to engage your brains. Um, by listening to this lecture, you are certainly engaging your brain. Uh, mentally stimulating activities that incorporate social engagement and a sense of purpose have been shown to be uh, very beneficial for brain health. Your brain is very much a use it or lose it organ. So we really wanna keep it active and in doing so, it may make you less susceptible to disease or certainly better able to uh, persevere uh, with a disease like stroke. So patients who are much more active uh, intellectually beforehand um, tend to do better in rehab. So um, this is something that I would encourage you to look at. Uh, I know there's that stereotype of crossword puzzles being beneficial, but it's really more than that. Um, it's taking a class, it's volunteering, 
it's doing something creative, be it gardening or painting, uh, learning a new hobby. These are things that are um, a wonderful investment for you um, and certainly are going to protect your brain. Okay, so how can I learn more? Uh, like I said, there's resources available. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, after this. I would direct you if you're um, interested in doing a little research on your own. The first place I always go when I wanna learn about stroke is strokeassociation.org. Um, if you're on Facebook, this is a great um, page to like because they will sort of push through your feed, different recommendations, um, latest uh, research that they want to promote uh, about stroke and heart disease. So I really like that organization. And then also the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Um, they have a lot of good kind of uh, brain basics pages. So I would definitely direct you uh, there as well. And that is it. So thank you so much for your attention. I really hope you came away with something new um, and I wish you all happy, healthy brains. Thank you. Lauren, thank you so much. That was an absolutely wonderful, very comprehensive um, webinar. I think we all know a lot more and especially, I think it's really important what you were saying about if you notice any of the signs of stroke to get medical attention immediately. Um, not, don't just pass it off as, um, is, oh, it's no big deal. So I think that was a really, really good point that you made, as, along with all the others. But thank you very much. It looks like we don't have any questions right now in the question box. Like you did such a comprehensive job of explaining everything. If We'll just wait one second. If anybody has any questions, you can just type it into the question box and hit enter. Um, otherwise, I just want to let everyone know that when you leave today's webinar, you're going to receive a quick five-question survey. It's just like you, know, you just pick an answer. Um, we would really appreciate it if you would take a few minutes to provide your feedback. That way we can continue to improve in the future as we bring more Vigor Wellness webinars your way. We'd like to know what you liked and what you didn't like. Um, you also receive a follow-up email within probably about three to four hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. So you can uh, view the webinar again or you can share it with others. Um, also, our past wellness webinars are on the friendslifecare.org website under resources. You can find those if you're interested. And um, you, the email that you're going to receive with the link to the recording will also have um, information about our next bigger wellness webinar, which is called Journey to Holism, Living a Full Life, which is being held at 11 a.m. on Tuesday, May 12th. And um, thank you so much for being here. Lauren, thank you so much. Oh, we did get a question. Hold on one second. Oh. What is the organization that certifies hospitals for stroke care? Oh, great question. So it's called the Joint Commission. Uh, for hospital accreditation. Um, the abbreviation you may hear is JCO, um, but certainly if you just type in Joint Commission, um, it'll direct you to um, the Joint Commission in general. Um, sometimes even though if you are just looking for, it, uh, they have lots of different accreditations. So in terms of the disease specific, sometimes if you just look at um, stroke centers near me is a great search term. Um, Sometimes, depending on the state you're in, it can be uh, a little tricky. What I've just recently become part of a task force for my state in Virginia, and um, part of what we're looking at as a state is um, looking at almost like when you go online to look for a store, like a store locator, is being able to type in your zip code um, and find a stroke center near you. So, um, but I actually looked up for Pennsylvania recently, and Pennsylvania, um, their Department of Health does have a, a locator in terms of knowing where the stroke centers are. But to answer the question, it's the Joint Commission for Hospital Accreditation. Thank you very much. And we have one other question, and that is how important is it to eat organic fruits and vegetables? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think organic and local and seasonal and all of that is really important, um, but I wouldn't necessarily deter someone, um, let's say if they have an option to eat an apple that's, you know, not organic to avoid it. Um, I think that in general, um, it's just important that you're eating those fruits and vegetables. Um, dark leafy greens especially have been um, found to be enormously beneficial. So um, while I would always encourage people to be eating, um, you know, foods and vegetables that are grown organically um, and close to home, I think that the focus should just be on getting them into your body anyway. So, um, you know, if you have access to it, great. You know, sometimes I go to my grocery store 
and the organic um, you know, kale doesn't look really all that great, but the non-organic kale looks really good. I know I'm gonna eat it, so I'll, I'll just make that choice in the moment. So um, do the best you can, but just remember, it's a lots of fruits and vegetables every day. That's the best you can do. Okay, perfect, excellent. So it looks like that is the last of our questions. Like I said, you did such a thorough job of explaining everything. I think you answered everyone's question during the presentation. <laughs> but thank you so much, Lauren. That was really wonderful. We really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.